Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Annelise Lemos, working at Grand Thornton Bharat. Welcome you to today's webinar, which is hosted in collaboration with FRR Immigration. Today's topic is tax and regulatory considerations while planning a second residence. Today amongst us, we have with us experts in the field who will be speaking on the various residency programs and regulations. I'm going to give a brief walkthrough on what is on today's agenda. To begin with, we have two esteemed speakers from FRR Immigration, Jay Mehta and Aditya Mehta, who will provide a brief insight into the residency programs of UK, Portugal, Greece, and US. Jay Mehta is a director and Aditya Mehta, country strategist at FRR Immigration, joined their family business, FRR Group, in 2013. And in 2016, they saw a huge opportunity in providing investment migration consulting services and expanded the firm's offerings to include this, thus recently ranking FRR Immigration as one of the top 25 consultants globally in immigration services. In a few moments from now, we will also gain insight into the Indian foreign exchange remittance regulations and tax considerations by Priyanka Sahi, who is a chartered accountant and subject matter expert. She also specializes in ad advising clients on tax and FEMA matters. We will further be discussing the local tax considerations for each of these programs with special focus on the US tax considerations under EB-5 program for which we have Lloyd Pinto, partner at Grand Thornton Bharat, who will shed light on the same. He is a chartered accountant and leader of the US tax practice at Grand Thornton Bharat with 20 years of experience in the field. So folks, if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, request you to please post it in the Q&A box and we will address as many as we can towards the end of the webinar. I'd now like to call upon Aditya to please lead the discussion. Yes. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, GT, for hosting this webinar. Uh, and thank you for having us. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to, I'm going to dive into a little, bit about, uh, a little bit about us very quickly. We are a family-owned business since 1983. Uh, spanning our experience, our legacy business has been around financial services across equities and foreign exchange broking. Uh, and advisory services. We recently added uh, immigration by investment, SR, uh, LRS solutions and uh, US student loans to our basket. And that caters to high net worth individuals, banks, institutions, retail clients, uh, with the help of 84 people at the group level uh, across 15 offices uh, in India. Okay, next slide, please. Coming to why we are here today, uh, India is one of the largest immigration by investment markets. Uh, we've been operating in this space for the, over a period of five years, effectively three years barring COVID. Uh, our track record states like uh, we've raised over a fifty, uh, we've raised over fifty million dollars across uh, four a hundred plus families across twenty seven projects globally, uh, with a hundred percent success rate so far, all the way from investment to repayment. Yes, this entire life cycle includes an investment amount, and hopefully at the end of it our investors get their money back. The FRR uh, immigration country list, there are, there are dozens of programs out there. Um, we are going to be focusing on four programs today. The, some of the countries that we offer on the citizenship by investment front are Grenada and Turkey. On the residency by investment, we have the most popular program, the US being the EB-5 green card program. UK is the startup visa program. Spain is the Spanish golden visa. Portugal golden visa. Malta residency permit, as well as Greece golden visa. And lastly, the Canadian startup visa program. 
why FRR? Uh, we'd like to get into our expertise where we operate in a highly regulated environment. Our sister companies are regulated by the Reserve Bank of India as well as the Securities Exchange Board of India. For our immigration by investment business, we even have an informal guidance from the Securities Exchange Board of India as to a modus operandi, how to operate in this space. We are a registered investment advisor in India. And the recent feather in the hat is we are a registered rep of an SEC and FINRA registered broker dealer in the US. Our due diligence process is fairly extensive. All the 27 projects that we raise money for globally for the benefit of 100 plus families. I, my colleague Jay, and two more team members have been to each of these 27 projects located in Portugal, Grenada, the US, in the UK, and Canada, uh, and have evaluated these projects from a financial standpoint as well as from an immigration safety standpoint. These are the 27 projects that we've raised money for. There are many, many more projects that we've chosen not to work for and raise money for. We will handhold you through the entire process, uh, all the way from initiating the application with civil documents, uh, with the correct attestation, with the help of our partner like GT, we would be able to uh, assist in uh, getting you the right advice for international tax, FEMA advice, and even outward remittances with our partnering banks at favorable rates. There are absolutely no hidden costs. All of this advice is for free. Uh, we will handhold you through the tenure of this investment. It can take anywhere between a year in the Caribbean programs all the way to even seven to eight years in the US program. Uh, all costs and risks are assessed upfront. Uh, all of these programs that we will go on to discuss are deemed at risk. FRR mitigates that risk to a great extent by our due diligence parameters. Next, moving into the next segment, uh, we would like to discuss the benefits associated with uh, residency by investment at this point. Uh, if we can have a poll, uh, uh, Priyanka, that would help. Or Barbie. We have a quick poll question for you here. Uh, it might pop up on your screen right now. Why are you considering a second residency? That question would have popped up on your screen right now. A, quality of life be creating optionality for the next gen or even yourselves, maybe tax management or to overcome education and employment hurdles. I think let's give about 20 seconds to, to get the answer for these polls. In the meantime, Jay, could we move on to the next slide? Okay, I think we should get a, a few answers in uh, for the poll. Can we share the poll, poll results, please, with uh, the panelists? Wow, we've got a whopping figure of 61% of assuming quality of life. Uh, most of the audience may be resident Indians here. Uh, thank you for attending. Acquiring a second residency benefits around acquiring a second residency. We're gonna discuss four main programs out here, Portugal, the UK, Greece, and uh, the US. I'm gonna cover Portugal and Greece have similar benefits like visit the Schengen zone, uh, visa free for three months, every six months. You do not need a passport to travel in and out of the Schengen zone. You can travel on your residency permit that you will get, whether you take the Portugal golden visa program or the Greece golden visa program. Free healthcare is, asso is associated with the UK and Portugal. Both jurisdictions offer you free healthcare. Uh, yes, um, your more um, specific surgeries that are elective surgeries that could include a cataract surgery or something that could be at fair market price. Education benefits is something that's been very, very common across uh, all these programs and especially parents of um, kids who are on their way there to study, whether it is the UK, whether it is the US or even Europe, even Europe. Education benefits could include after getting a residency of that particular jurisdiction, you can avail for a discounted tuition fee. 
um, employment or, ben or business uh, opportunities. Both my colleague and I have been victim to the whole H-1B visa system in the US. We'd have to come back to India over 10 years ago because we didn't get that lottery system. The US CB5 green card program allows you to get that benefit well before you graduate from university. It is all encompassing US green card. You can start your own business. You can expand your family business that is in India or elsewhere to the US. You have no immigration overhang. At the end of the day, immigration is not ruling your life in that jurisdiction. Quality of life. What is quality of life? Everyone says that, hey, it's too hot in India or it's too cold somewhere else. Places like the US, places like UK, although depressing a little bit when it comes to weather, but quality of life, really, Portugal uh, pips uh, everything else. You've got the sand and you've got the mountains right there. Um, great weather all year round. Fairly, um, fairly low tax uh, jurisdiction. It gives you a few tax benefits, like some, some might choose tax management systems, of which our colleague will cover going forward. And then the best part of it is that you can acquire uh, citizenship. So all these four residency programs that we will discuss over a period of time can help you qualify for the passport of these jurisdictions, which subject to certain requirements, which my colleague will cover. And this can therefore be transferred on to future generations. It can go down to up to three generations, no matter which, pro which option you choose. Next slide, please, Jay. I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, uh, Jay, to go through the comparative study between these four programs that we are discussing today. Thanks, Aditya, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So quickly diving into the four countries that we have uh, to discuss today, one of them being Portugal. Uh, and like you all rightly mentioned, quality of life is your priority uh, for considering a second residency. Portugal does stand out as my colleague rightly mentioned, and gives you this, the sea and the mountains. Um, so Portugal Golden Visa Program, uh, there are actually multiple options for this. However, we focus more into the real estate rehabilitation program. It's one of the most widely uh, used programs. And I, I think, I believe 50% of the market share of the Portugal Golden Visa falls under this program. Uh, this program has two investment options. One is for 280,000 euros and the other is 350,000 euros. Uh, the 280, the difference between the two is the 280K is more rural than the 350, as well as the 280K does not give you any interest on your investment, whereas the 350K gives you up to a 3% interest um, on an annual basis. Your investment is for a five-year period um, and your time to getting the golden visa from say day zero, which is when you apply, is about 12 to 16 months. This used to be nine to 12 months, uh, but with COVID and with the government changing, there have been certain delays and hence, it's fair to assume a 12 to 16 month time frame for this. Um, your residency requirement is one of the lowest that any program out there that offers, especially for the EU zone. It's seven days per year over a five year period. Uh, you are subject to two renewals within this five year, and we can definitely discuss more on that. Um, you can opt for citizenship uh, in six years, in your sixth year. So once you've done the seven days per year for five years, in your sixth year, you'll choose either the permanent residency or citizenship. And yes, you do have to learn the Portuguese language for this. Um, it's the basic A2 level Portuguese conversational really um, and that that's what helps you graduate to either permanent residency or citizenship uh, this program allows you to take your spouse as well as your dependent children as long as they are unmarried under the age of 18 and you do have to prove the dependent financial dependency all the way up until year six when you choose your own path um, once you do receive the uh, if you if you choose the permanent residency of Portugal you have the benefit of um, visiting any Schengen nation for three months every six months. If you choose citizenship, you have visa-free access to over 180 plus countries. I believe the Portuguese passport is either the fourth or the sixth strongest passport in the world. Um, so definitely a great country to consider for quality of life, for cheap cost of living, 
uh, definitely one of them that that FRR would suggest um, given the parameters. Our next country is the United Kingdom. Uh, here is a startup investment program where you invest in another UK resident startup. This has to be kind of a seed based startup. So there is no active trading or, or, or uh, business going on in this startup. It's at the idea stage. Um, the minimum investment amount is 250,000 pounds and your investment period is for three years. It takes roughly four to six months for you to get uh, your work permit under this startup after which you do have to spend six months, at least six months every year for the three years in order to graduate to what they call the indefinite leave to remain in the UK. Once you do get this to maintain the indefinite leave to remain in the UK, you uh, have a residency requirement of fairly one day a year. You can opt for citizenship in the UK as long as you have stayed there for five years. Um, since the UK is an English speaking country, uh, there is no language test and you can take your spouse and unmarried children under the age of 18 along with you for your application. Uh, unfortunately, with because of Brexit, the EU zone is not applicable for visa free travel and hence you're restricted to only the UK uh, once you do get your indefinite leave to remain. That's United Kingdom for you. Um, moving on to Greece. Here, this is a real estate investment option. Uh, the investment option is twofold. Again, the first option is 250,000 euros and the second option is 500,000 euros. The 500,000 euro option is fairly new since the government, I think, I believe on 1st December of this year, changed the rules and increased the amount for certain localities or certain cities, such as Athens, Mykonos, um, and two others, uh, Santorini as well. Um, the investment period is for five years where you have to maintain this investment amount. However, after your first renewal, after five years, you can choose another property. And in order to maintain your golden visa, you have to always have um, a permanent address in Greece. It takes about three to six months to process your golden visa, including two trips that you would make, one to select the property and the second to do your biometrics uh, in Greece. Uh, there is no residency requirement to maintain this golden visa and you can opt for citizenship in approximately seven years. Yes, there is a, there is a language test. You have to learn Greek. It is, it, people say that it is fairly uh, more difficult than learning Portuguese, uh, just for a comparison. Uh, and your spouse and unmarried children under the age of 18 uh, with you on the one application. The 18 years is also, I, I believe it can be extended to 21 or 24 years as long as you choose, as long as the children are financially dependent on the primary applicant. Um, Greece offers the sim similar um, visa-free travel uh, permits to the Schengen region if you choose the golden visa. If you choose citizenship, you have access to over 180 countries. Lastly, uh, the US. Uh, the US, the investment option is an underlying real estate or infrastructure projects. It's actually a job creation program. And because of the requirement of job creation, your investment that is made into real estate development, uh, whether it's a hotel or uh, an office tower or uh, any infrastructure projects or a residential complex, all, those were, all, the, all the money spent leads to job creation. And in, and in real estate project, projects, job creation turns out to be the highest uh, uh, yield. The minimum, minimum investment amount is 800,000. It has gone up from 500,000 as of March of this year. Uh, your investment period is about five to seven years. It takes you about three years to get to your conditional uh, green card. Although for people that reside within the US, you may seem you may receive benefits of your application in roughly six to nine months. And we can dive into that a little later. Um, your residency requirement, although there is no defined period, it is suggested that you spend majority of your time every year in the US since you want to prove that you are uh, willing to become a, a green card holder in the US. You can opt for citizenship as long as you have lived for two and a half years in a five year period on a green card. Um, there is no language test for an EB-5. 
Uh, you can take your spouse and unmarried children under the age of 21 along with you on the one application. Uh, since this is only a residency, there is no visa-free travel applicable to other countries. So while that was a lot of information, I'm quickly going to put up uh, a summary on our screen. Um, and while we look at this, I'd like to quickly move over to how do we make such investments? And I'd like to uh, ask Priyanka to come on and, and uh, take care of that segment of our conversation today. Thank you. Over to you, Priyanka. Sure. Thank you, Jay. Um, we're going to have my slides. Uh, yeah. Um, so like Jay mentioned, uh, all these uh, residency, second residency program that uh, that uh, was spoken about do require uh, some investments to be made uh, from India. Uh, and therefore for all resident Indian, uh, what becomes important is to evaluate the liberalized remittance scheme. And how does one uh, kind of uh, make those financial commitment given the Indian uh, regulatory environment that governs uh, residents sending money out of India? Uh, in terms of uh, the Greece and Portugal program, which require you to invest into real estate, uh, the regulations, the LR, uh, the liberal remittance scheme, the LRS regulation permit Indian residents to acquire real estate outside India. There are various modes uh, which are possible, uh, start uh, ranging from inheritance to gift. Uh, but the one relevant for our discussion today is the annual remittance permitted under the LRS of $250,000 per individual. Uh, these remittances can be consolidated with resident relatives so long as it is compliant with the LRS rules and regulations. Uh, interestingly, uh, the limit of $250,000 is not adequate to, you know, kind of uh, fulfill the financial commitment under any of the programs discussed. And therefore, we've seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, families or uh, uh, resident Indian kind of planning this in a way where it happens over a period of uh, over a few financial years. Uh, you know, sometime uh, uh, money which sent money gone out in March gets clubbed with the money in April and you do this investment. Uh, that's how it's been planned practically uh, to meet those financial commitments. Uh, there has been a recent amendment in the master direction in the liberalized remittance scheme, which uh, basically is a gray area currently until further clarified. Uh, there's a requirement now that if there is any unspent foreign exchange sitting outside India, uh, uh, the regulations seem to suggest that if not applied within 180 days, that money needs to be brought back into India. Uh, meaning whereby the planning that was happening of sending money out over different financial years, uh, if not deployed within a certain period of time, uh, may be required to be brought back. It remains to be a, a gray area in terms of, you know, and we're hoping that this will be sooner or later clarified. Uh, but as we stand today, there is, a dip, there is a possible exposure on the requirement to repatriate and realize the proceeds back into India, if not uh, deployed within 180 days. On to the next slide, please. Uh, the other mode of kind of meeting the financial commitments have been gifts, uh, gifts that resident Indian uh, can give to their relative outside India. Uh, any gift by a resident uh, Indian will be uh, sub will be obviously subject to the uh, overall threshold of two hundred fifty thousand dollars in a year. Uh, we've also, you know, the option of maybe a non-resident relative gifting of outside India and therefore someone pulling, fulfilling the financial commitment. Uh, that option uh, uh, could be there, but really uh, it doesn't work if the recipient of the gift is a resident Indian, because like I said, uh, there is a requirement for resident Indians to realize foreign exchange and bring it into India within a specified time period. And therefore uh, the option of a gift received by a non-resident uh, does not facilitate your financial commitment under any of the programs. Uh, as far as uh, investment in foreign securities is concerned, uh, there has been, uh, you know, the overseas investments rule did get amended in August. 
so any uh, any gift of shares from a non resident or a resident to a resident if it is under under in by way of an inheritance under a will it's permissible without any limit uh and and similarly any gift of foreign securities between resident is permitted but any gift from a non resident to a resident will now be will now require an approval under the foreign contribution regulation act uh this is a new uh, amendment uh, you know uh, the rbi has actually uh, rec- uh, now put in the requirement of getting an approval under the fcra rules if there is uh, intended to be a gift of foreign shares uh my non resident to a resident effectively because it is without consideration <clears throat> uh on the next slide um uh we also uh, the amended overseas investment rule in august 2020 also did bring about some clarity uh, a lot of uh, you know a lot of terms were defined when it came to uh, understanding what an overseas investment meant for individuals what it meant for companies uh and they they, they kind of specifically define an overseas direct investment to mean different from an overseas portfolio investment and an overseas direct investment is any acquisition of an unlisted equity share uh, any subscription to a memorandum of a foreign entity or an investment in a listed equity shares of a foreign company provided it is more than 10% or if less than 10% it comes with control all these investments now fall under what is uh, what we now understand to be the overseas direct investment anything which is other than the overseas direct investment is now an overseas portfolio investment which effectively is uh, you know if you really look at it it's investment of less than 10% in shares of an unlist uh, sorry shares of a listed foreign company uh, there is a specific exclusion and uh, opi is not permitted in unlisted debt instruments it's not permitted in derivatives securities which are issued by resident indian unless it is in an ifsc and commodities uh, uh, there is however Uh, among the permitted list of what o- overseas portfolio investment can be done in is a mention of uh, uh, being able to invest in funds which are regulated uh, by regulators in the host country <clears throat> uh this the the the, the debate the odi and opi as defined uh, does uh, does open an interesting room for discussion which is on the next slide um yeah so so really uh, the way uh, the overseas direct investment rules have been rolled out uh, and i'm speaking currently only for resident individuals because uh, that's the audience here uh, any investment be it an odi or an opi under the new rules obviously subject to the overall limit of under the lrs which is 250000 uh, dollars however an odi is permitted in an operating foreign entity which is not engaged in financial services sector uh and if that foreign entity is controlled by the indian resident it should not have a subsidiary or a steps out subsidiary uh those are the restrictions that have now been brought in when it comes to an odi done by resident individual uh one could one could argue one could basically read this to mean that if there is an uh if there is an investment in an unlisted foreign security uh which is engaged in financial services like a fund it would not be permissible permissible under for a resident individual however the definition of or overseas portfolio investment like i mentioned does permit you to invest in units of a reg, uh, regulated fund overseas and to that extent an investment in an offshore fund should be permissible Yeah, and therefore those structures which are uh, kind of uh, looked at for an EV5 should still be workable uh when it comes to the uk program the startup program it's important to note that under the new overseas investment rules uh odi in startup is not permitted out of borrowed fund and therefore even if an individual were to make an ODI, uh, odi uh it will have to be from funds that are owned uh, by the individual himself or herself on the next slide i have uh, we've given a very high level uh, comparison of what tax landscape could look like in portugal greece and the united kingdom 
uh, we'll have Lloyd cover the U.S. tax in detail, but uh, you know this is uh, this is just to give you a flavor of uh, the tax rates in Portugal, uh, Greece, uh, United Kingdom. The individual tax rates range from uh, up fourteen percent and go up till a forty-five, forty-eight percent in these jurisdictions. They're progressive. There's a lower rate of tax on capital gain tax. However, for um, uh, for um, you know non-residents or high net worth individuals who are looking to take up residency, transfer residency in Portugal and Greece, there are alternative uh, regimes uh, which have been prescribed subject to uh, fulfillment of certain conditions, which does give a significant relief uh, from taxation on foreign sourced income. Uh, the United Kingdom also has a remittance basis of taxation when it comes to non-dom uh, UK residents. And therefore, to that extent, if those programs are being considered, there is a certain amount of planning that can be uh, that can go in with the subject matter experts from those jurisdictions. Uh, there is no inheritance tax in Portugal. Uh, however, there is a stamp duty for transferring transferring immovable property uh, to those other than your uh, lineal and uh, descendants and ascendants. Uh, Greece does have an inheritance tax. Again, it ranges depending on the proximity of the donee and the, uh, the rel relation between the donor and the donee. The United Kingdom also does have an inheritance tax. And each of these jurisdictions does have a real estate tax, uh, which is an annual levy and levy depending on the location of the real estate, the nature of real estate, the zone, etc. Uh, like I said, these are very high level comments. It is advisable uh, that you know we bring in uh, local jurisdiction experts, but there is uh, enough and more planning that can be done around taxes if you're looking at either of these residency programs. Uh, with that, I'll hand, hand it over to Lloyd, who can now take us in more detail on the US tax implication under the EB-5 program. And Lloyd, over to you. Thanks, thanks, uh, Priyanka, for this. Uh... I will cover uh, now some of the key U.S. income as well as you know gift and estate tax implications uh, for people who are looking to take up uh, a U.S. Uh, green card pursuant to the EB-5. Uh, U.S. Uh, obviously over the last uh, several years has been a very popular destination and EB-5 also has been uh, one of the preferred routes given uh, the H-1B lottery and some of the other uh, considerations, uh, you know, that my speakers before me, uh, you know, had a conversation about. Uh, so EB-5 being a residency option by investment uh, has definitely opened up a lot of uh, opportunities for folks to take up a more permanent ability to work in the U.S. without having to worry about the H-1B lotteries uh, and some of the other uh, work-related visas. Having said that, what, what's very important is to understand, uh, you know, the tax regime uh, in the U.S. Um, and how some of the uh, Indian assets uh, and taxes on those kind of portfolio assets, uh, uh, you know, interplay with the green card. Uh, and that's something we will talk about. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is what I've mentioned. We've got to be uh, aware about how the U.S. taxes uh income of uh, the green card holders so once the eb5 investor has moved through the process and has achieved uh, or received the green card uh, he or she will be taxed on global income that is very important to understand uh, we get a lot of questions that if i take the green card and if i'm living uh, you know more than six months in india for example uh, do i still pay us taxes uh, the answer is yes. If you are a green card holder, technically uh, you are taxable on your global income. So whether it is Indian income, U.S. income or any other, uh, if you have assets or investment income in any other countries, uh, your global income has to be offered to tax in the U.S. Of course, there are there is a tax treaty between India and the U.S. Uh, and there are certain tax reliefs under the tax treaty. There is ability to take tax credits. Uh, and therefore optimize uh, your taxes. But what's important to know, uh, and a lot of people are still unaware that uh, you know, even after obtaining the green card, even if they live anywhere else in the world uh, and do not spend significant time in the US, uh, you will still be subject to US income taxes on your global income. 
the federal tax rate in the US is a progressive rate uh, and goes up to 37%. Uh, U.S. also has income taxes uh, at a local level. You could be taxed at a state level. Uh, in some states, you can also be taxed at a city level. New York has both uh, a state tax and New York City has city level taxes. Uh, there are a few states where there are no personal income taxes, uh, and those are some of the popular options for people who are looking to actually migrate and uh, you know live in the U.S. So Florida is one of them. Texas is another where there are no personal state income taxes, of course, you do have to pay your federal income taxes on your global income. Uh, on the other side, what's uh, again important is US has a, a gift as well as an estate tax regime, and we'll talk a bit uh, more uh, in the ensuing slides. But at a high level, what is important to understand is uh, that even on your global wealth, you will be uh, subject to tax uh, from an estate perspective. So some of the key income tax obligations that we spoke about, you know, a green card holder is definitely considered as a US tax resident uh, and you have to pay taxes on your global income. Now, in addition to, you know, paying taxes on global income, uh, what is also very critical from a compliance perspective is uh, there are a host of reporting obligations as well. Uh, once you become a U.S. tax resident, uh, paying taxes on global income uh, is just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, the U.S. wants a lot of information regarding your overseas financial assets. So there are specific disclosures. Uh, they're popularly called the FBAR forms, where you have to disclose your uh, you know, foreign banks and other financial assets. Uh, there are certain additional reporting obligations in your tax returns, which covers all, uh, it's a statement of foreign financial assets, so you have to also report your, uh, you know, personal investments, your private uh, investments, uh, along with your financial assets. So there's a lot of disclosure that is definitely required. Uh, not only that, you have to also disclose accounts where you have even a signature authority. Uh, so let's say you're a key employee in an organization. Uh, you may not own equity in that organization, but you are a uh, you know CEO, CXO, uh, you know, or an authorized signatory on some of the company's bank accounts. Even those accounts are something that you have to report in your U.S. tax returns. And there are severe uh, you know penal obligations or penal uh, consequences if those accounts are you know not disclosed. Uh, in addition to financial assets, anything uh, that is your investment assets, which may be held either in the form of uh, investments in Indian partnerships, LLPs, uh, Indian companies or trusts will have their own set of disclosures uh, in the US returns. With respect to investment in companies, there are also specific tax regimes. They are known as a controlled foreign corporation or the CFC tax regime. The CFC tax regime applies to entities where U.S. individuals or U.S. shareholders own more than 50 percent. So there's a majority uh, U.S. tax resident owned companies and they have uh, a very specific set of regulations that apply to them, uh, which means you could be taxed on the deemed income of those companies, even though you have not taken a dividend or even though you have not sold shares of that company. So there is potential for, uh, you know, effectively a tax based on deemed income that these companies own. So that's uh, something that we have to be careful about and needs some robust planning. Uh, then there is also a, a different regime. It's called the Passive Foreign Investment Company Regime or PFIC. And this is one area where I see a lot of uh, U.S. investors, uh, you know, uh, have an issue with. Uh, anything that is a investment entity uh, will effectively fall into the definition of a PFIC, and this doesn't have a shareholding threshold. So let's say that you have mutual fund investments in India. Uh, these will be classified as uh, PFIC investments, and the consequences of these are uh, these will be taxed at ordinary income rates. You will not get the special you know, capital gains tax rates. Capital gains are taxed at 20%. But ordinary income will be taxed at progressive rates, uh, you know, as high as 37 uh, percent. So mutual fund investments will fall under uh, the PFIC regimes. 
And these are some of the investment uh, assets that we have to be careful about once somebody wants to take up a US uh, green card. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so as I mentioned, some of the key tax concerns for Indian EB-5 investors, uh, you know, in India, certain incomes are either tax exempt, they could be tax deferred, or maybe taxed at preferential rates in India. Uh, for example, you know, listed securities, long-term capital gains, we have a special rate. Um, certain long-term uh, gains on mutual funds, we may have preferential rates. If you sell a house, there is a, there are specific tax regimes in India where you can reinvest in another house or in certain assets, and you could defer your Indian capital gains liabilities. Uh, there are certain tax-free bonds on which you may not pay taxes in India. The question usually arises is, you know, can I get those same tax benefits in the US? And the answer is no. You will have to pay additional taxes, the differential taxes at least uh, on these incomes. Uh, in the US. So, so that becomes very important to plan, particularly you know, listed securities. The law changed just about four years back. Prior to that, long-term gains were exempt. And there are certain grandfathering rules in India. So another question I get a lot is, will I be able to take advantage of the grandfathering rules? Again, there, that's an Indian regulation and Indian law. Uh, the US will not give you the benefit of grandfathering. So the entire gain you know, may be taxable in the US. So these are some of the you know, key considerations that we see in a lot of uh, you know, EB-5 investors from a tax perspective. Uh, these are some of the tax-related questions uh, that we usually encounter. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, I spoke about earlier US estate and gift tax obligations. Uh, the US has a threshold above which the estate tax uh, is levied. For 2023, that threshold is 12.9 million. Uh, what is important to understand though, that uh, this threshold was actually 5 million uh, before President Trump came in 2017 and increased it to 10 million at that point in time. And since then it has been indexed for inflation every year. So it goes up about five, 600,000 every year. Uh, but this has a sunset clause uh, 2026, unless the then, uh, you know, future president or future regime decides to extend this threshold, uh, it is supposed to come back down to 5 million. So the 12.9 million that you see on your screen today uh, is perhaps a limited window for the next three years. Uh, the threshold could go back down to 5 million unless, uh, you know, the lawmakers make it permanent. What that means is if your global assets are above 12.9 million uh, on the date the individual passes away, uh, the estate uh, of or the global assets of that particular individual will be subject to an estate duty. And the current peak rate of estate duty is 40%. And estate will include all kinds of assets as real estate, your personal property, your shares, stocks, et cetera, any intangible property you own. Uh, so that will be taxed at a rate of 40%. So it, it's a big chunk of your wealth that can go to the US, so careful planning uh, is required if anybody from the family intends to take up uh, a US green card. Uh, during the lifetime, it is possible to make gifts, uh, you know, uh, tax free gifts. This is a small threshold that is available for 2023. The threshold is $17,000. So effectively, US individuals can gift uh, $17,000 per donee. So and one individual can make, you know, five different. $17,000 donations to five different individuals. Uh, so smaller gifts are permissible without paying gift taxes. If you make a larger gift, let's say you wanna make a $100,000 gift, then that will be subject to the US gift tax and gift tax is also at 40%. So both US estate, which is applicable at uh, the demise of the individual, gift tax is applicable for gifts during the lifetime. Uh, we need to think about what could be the potential tax implications on, on those transfers. Next slide, please. Uh, lastly, the US expatriation rules. I think this is also important. We see a lot of families take up the green card more often than not to facilitate it for the next generation. They want their kids to be able to go to college and you know, work thereafter in the US without having to worry about uh, you know, the H-1B and such. Uh, and the intention is uh, you know, once the kids have the permanent green card, 
uh, the parents would like to give up their green card status. Uh, so here, again, it is very important to understand that US has a certain regime uh, which also taxes you on exit. So, so while you it's easy to get in, it's not that easy perhaps to get out. Uh, you cannot just, uh, you know, the green card status is just not terminated by moving abroad or letting the green card expire. There is a specific process that you have to follow both with the immigration authorities as well as the tax authorities to ensure that you have closed the loop on your green card. We see many families who've just come back and let the green card expire and think that, you know, uh, you know they're fully compliant, but that's not the case. Uh, there is an exit tax that will be applicable if you have held the green card for more than eight years during the last 15 years. So this is a very important uh, window uh, that you have to be careful about. Um, if you hold a green card in the first seven years, you perhaps have a free pass. Uh, you can give up your green card without being subject to the exit tax rules. Uh, but if you hold on to the green card for eight years or more, you have to then deal with the expatriation regime or the exit tax. And the exit tax is basically, uh, if you were to sell all your global assets today, what is the gain that you would make? And on that, the government will want a 24% tax on your global mark-to-market gains. So again, very important to think through people who are taking up a green card specifically to facilitate uh, you know, uh, family members. But if the individuals are not really migrating, uh, to the US, then it's important to know if they want to give up the green card in a short time frame. Uh, this window of eight years is very important. You have to think about giving it up or before eight years. Uh, if you're holding it for a longer term, then uh, you have to look through the expatriation rules to ensure that you don't trigger a high uh, payout uh, on exiting the US. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is the last slide, uh, just so when we have people who are looking to uh, sort of immigrate to the US or take up a green card, uh, there are many, uh, you know, activities that can be done. Uh, we do a pre-immigration planning project for these families. Uh, I've just mentioned some of the ideas that we generally, uh, you know, uh, leverage when we work with such families so that we can optimize on uh, you know, future US taxes. You know, one example is stepping up the basis uh, in your assets. This simply means selling and buying back, you know, certain appreciated assets, usually done for, let's say, listed securities. So if you're sitting on significant Indian uh, gains on Indian securities, before moving to the US, you could effectively sell those, pay your Indian taxes, should be comparatively lower, and perhaps buy it back. So you reset your cost base to the current cost if you want to hold on to those shares for the longer term. So these are some of your you know, crown jewels of your portfolio and you want to hold for the next 10, 20 years. Uh, you could look at uh, just selling and buying it back and resetting your cost base to today's level. Uh, in certain cases, we could look at accelerating income. So if you're taking up a green card, if there, is, uh, if there are certain assets that you want to sell or certain income, uh, business income that you are currently undergoing uh, you know, an, uh, a project with, you would want to accelerate those kind of incomes so that it falls in the pre-green card period so you don't have to pay taxes in the US. Uh, the flip side of that is deferral of losses. So if you have loss-making securities uh, and you're sitting on certain substantial losses, we would prefer to trigger those losses once you get the green card so that we can get the benefit of those losses during your US residency period. Pre-arrival gifting. So before you move to the US, obviously today India does not have, uh, you know, an estate tax uh, or an inheritance tax regime. So we can plan around, uh, you know, certain gifts, at least between family members, there are certain exemptions, certain relatives to whom you could make large gifts without incurring any significant India taxes. So we could look at, uh, you know, gifting of certain assets before moving to the US. And of course, uh, use of trust. So, if we want to protect from US estate duty, we have to look at uh, options around setting up trusts. Could be in India uh, uh, for your Indian assets. If you have overseas assets, we could explore certain uh, overseas trusts uh, where we are sheltering them from potential future uh, US estate duty. So these are just uh, you know, some of the ideas uh, that we generally try to leverage when we are planning for families who are uh, looking to take up a US green card.
Uh, I think back to you, Annalise. Uh, and if we have, I think just a question for request for the audience. If you have any questions, uh, you know, for all the panelists, uh, you can use the Q and A tab to you know, type in your questions, and uh, uh, we will try to address them uh, uh, as best as we can. Back to you, Annalise. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, so we have received a couple of questions, and we will address those first. And in the meantime, the rest of you can continue to post your questions in. The first question being from Devati, maybe Lloyd, you can answer this. Under the EB-5 program, after receiving the green card, is the residency requirement of six months per year applicable to only the primary applicant or to spouse and children also? Sure. So maybe I can take that since it's uh, immigration related, at least. Okay. So yes, under the EB-5 program, your residency requirement is for the entire family. Um, the primary applicant, the spouse, and the children all have to maintain the approximate six months per year stay requirement. Okay. Uh, the next question being from Raghunath. On 180-day rule, can one invest the money in a listed equity or mutual fund closer to the 180 days and then de-invest it prior to making the EB-5 investment? I think, I think Priyanka. Um, uh, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so you could, uh, um, you could do that. You could kind of uh, invest the money initially in another investment product and then put it in the EB-5. The only challenge is uh, that uh, the EB-5 will actually be in, uh, uh, be in the form of an investment into a, into a fund or a corporate. And therefore, uh, you know, how do you kind of make the disclosure when you send the money out initially? Uh, there, uh, there, there could be a practical challenge and therefore it is recommended. Uh, that the money that you send out for an EB-5 uh, it goes with the declaration that it will be invested in the EB-5 program. Okay, thank you, Priyanka. The next question we have is by RK. If a person is in the US on a H-1B currently, but expects to get the EB-5 or GC in five to six years, does it make sense to get the child back to India for a year or two? then gift assets while they are an Indian resident and then go back for the EB-5. Should I repeat it? I think, uh, and so I think, I think there are two parts to this question. Yeah. One is more from an immigration perspective and the other maybe Priyanka is from a uh, uh, structuring perspective. Uh, but from an immigration perspective, that's not really advisable. Uh, because you know you would lose time in terms of achieving a green card, which is what uh, your your investment is for. Um, so I would suggest to start the application for EB five, um, and maybe if you need to, you know, explore the non resident Indian route. And, and I'm going to leave this for Priyanka to answer, but explore the non resident in, uh, Indian route or even the multiple financial years. Uh, Priyanka, I'd like to hand this over to you. Yeah, so Jay, I think uh, it has a U.S. tax request piece attached to it, Lloyd, so you can come in. But yeah, I mean, uh, you could look at coming back, uh, being residents in India, uh, gifting it to relatives, uh, claiming the exemption just currently there from gift tax in India. Uh, unless, uh, Lloyd, you want to answer any? Yeah, so I think when we talk about gifts, again, we have to be careful from a U.S. perspective. Uh, the gift tax is on the person giving the gift and not the person receiving. Uh, so the tax residency of the person giving the gift is also important. Uh, and whether such person has a U.S. domicile, right? even if you are an H-1B, but if you're a U.S. tax resident by virtue of you know living and working there, and if your domicile is considered to be the U.S., potentially you can be subject to a, a gift tax. Uh, so when we are talking about gifts, it will be relevant to know or at least be careful about the residency of the giver uh, because there could be a potential uh, you know, gift tax exposure there. Yeah. 
Yeah, I see one more question. I'll probably take that uh, on the DTA benefit yes. question from uh, Lalit. Uh, the answer there straightforward is yes, Lalit. Uh, the India and the US do have a uh, double tax avoidance treaty, and uh, and also and also this in in two aspects. Uh, while there is a treaty, there are certain clauses where, uh, you know, the the right to tax has been left open. The classic example is capital gains, right? The capital gains clause in the India-US tax treaty simply says that both countries have the right to tax capital gains under their own domestic laws. And this does uh, lead to certain complications because both countries have slightly different methods of taxing capital gains and the way they source it. So while yes, on most incomes, let's say on interest income, dividend incomes, uh, salary income, you should be able to take tax credits based on the treaty. Uh, but capital gains is one area where uh, the treaty has really left it open for both countries to decide uh, individually and apply their own law. And there can be certain uh, very weird answers uh, that that arise, uh, which may not seem logical. There's a potential for double tax also in some scenarios, particularly when it comes to capital gains. But most other areas, uh, you should be able to get a tax credit. And the other uh, relevant part, uh, again, is tax credits are only available against federal taxes. Uh, the states are not a part of the tax treaty, and therefore you will not get a credit uh, for against any state income taxes. So you will get credits for let's say, any taxes paid in India against the federal uh, tax, but no credits against any state income tax liability. Uh, the next question we have is from Pratik. After receiving the green card, how long would it take to get our parents under green card as well? So this is, again, more of a family-based uh, immigration question, something that we are not really qualified to answer since we cater only to the investment side. Although I believe um, if it really depends if you are uh, married or not, as well as um, to take older parents, it's much easier than to take siblings or it's much lesser time than to take siblings. So I think you should be fairly in a in a fairly good position to do that. But I would suggest best to seek advice from a from an immigration attorney about this. Um, Lalit has a follow up question to the DPAA. Uh, he's asking whether it's also available for the other countries like Portugal and Greece. So I'll I'll take I'll take that. So, so Lalit, yes, uh, if you qualify as a resident uh, of the country and both Portugal and Greece have a 183 days in a financial year stay, and of course, if you're looking up at taking up residency there and becoming a non-resident of India, then ideally there is a tax treaty between Portugal, India and Greece in India, uh, whereby you should be able to get uh, relief from any double taxation. Uh, but uh, like I said, this will be a this will be a uh, this will be apt to be answered by a local uh, tax consultant. And like Lloyd did mention, there could be leakages, there could be timing differences when it comes to claiming tax credits. Okay. Uh, the I, next I'll question. The, yeah, I'll take the follow up from uh, yeah. RK on RK. the question. Yeah. Uh, basically, if the gifter is an Indian citizen and recip uh, recipient is a U.S. Uh, EB-5 applicant. The first gift that the Indian resident makes to the US EB-5 applicant will not be taxable under US law, assuming this is trans a gift of Indian uh, assets, basically a bank transfer, right? Uh, but what that means, uh, RK, is now the US EB-5 applicant has a net worth of 13 million. So once that applicant gets a green card, uh, this 13 million is part of that individual's estate and eventually on the demise of that individual, if the 13 million still remains or grows into uh, an amount that is higher than the estate threshold, then there would be an estate duty. But the estate duty we are talking about is future estate duty. If the gift giver is an Indian resident, Indian citizen, and let's say you're transferring 13 million in Indian assets to a applicant, an applicant would mean somebody who has not yet got the green card, then there would be no current US gift taxes. So uh, I hope that answers your question. So in the interest of time, guys, we'll take up just last two questions. Uh, first being from Ruchi. 
in case of us persons acting as beneficiaries of indian trusts is the distribution of corpus income taxable in the us any disclosures required without any distribution okay so again uh, not a very simple question uh, ruchi but at a high level it depends on the nature of the indian trust it could be either you know what we call a grantor trust or a non grantor trust and that would determine uh, the us implication but assuming this is a question for a non grantor trust uh, usually the income distribution is what is taxable the corpus uh, may not be taxable but again that's a simplistic answer it will really depend on what kind of assets the trust has invested in and uh, whether or not the trust is a you know what the us calls a grantor or a non grantor trust the next question is from revati after receiving the gc if assets are sold in india before moving to us will the capital gains be taxed in india and us um I'll I'll try to answer that, and Priyanka, you can add. Uh, see, once you receive the green card, uh, you become a U.S. tax resident. Now, assuming in that same year uh, you are also an Indian tax resident, or even if you're not, if it's an Indian asset, uh, India will seek to tax you on those gains, and so will be the U.S. Uh, so, I believe the answer would be yes, both India and the U.S. If the assets are Indian assets. because after receiving the the gc your uh, us tax residency period really starts hmm. priyanka you would like to add anything or shall i oh. no i uh, so yeah so and and i think lawyer they'll have to then we'll have to look at the uh, tie breaker rule right. to see where does the residency break to so evaluate whether any credits can be claimed uh, but then again the whole uh, discussion on source state and credit state that that requires a detailed evaluation so everyone on behalf of gt bharat and frr i'd like to thank each one of you for your time it was a very insightful discussion and i am sure the audience like me has had a lot of new learnings and gained immense knowledge from today's session hope the session was helpful and please feel free to reach out to us over email if you have any queries the details of our panel members are here on your screen so please uh, reach out to them thank you all to uh, for to our panel members and our attendees for taking out the time to attend the webinar thank you thank you thank, thank you all bye